Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And I am mindful that I am half an hour between you and lunch being ready and hot, so I will try to make this as concise as I can. Um, I'm the de I, have, I wear a couple of hats on campus. I am substantively a lecturer in the Department of Management Studies within the Faculty of Social Sciences, but I'm also Deputy Dean and of the faculty. So it's always interesting to hear from those who are not in the governance structure this one question, what is it that you actually do? We see you flitting here, we see you flitting there, you're always at meetings, you're always so busy. I ever, for those of you not in the governance structure within your faculties, you ever wonder what it is that the dean, the heads of departments, the deputy deans seem so busy doing? So this part of the presentation is about looking at some of the roles that we play and how, and I deliberately use IT here because we're going to debunk IT in a moment, how IT can support some of the things that we do. And I'm going to, after coming off those presentations on the high, this might be a little low, and then I'll try to build up to the end. But I want to set it within the context of the new strategic plan. How many of you have actually seen the new strategic plan? Okay. For those of you who haven't, I just picked this part out of the strategic plan. Not, not, not for you to read, but this is the framework, not for you to read. The strategic framework, because it sets out what the mission, vision, core values, and so on, but what I want to get to are the strategic themes and the ones that really affect what I'm going to be discussing today. There are two of them, the internal operational processes and teaching, learning, and student development with the aspect on the student development. Um, internal processes, operational processes. And the deputy principal spoke about this this morning when she talked about the superlative student experience. And in order to ensure that that student has the experience that they want, we want them to have so that we can get satisfied alumni willing to donate back to the university, it is not only the academic experiences that we have to look at, it's also the administrative experiences that we have to look at. So within the context of the strategic plan, the two key themes that I want to take a look at and to set this in context is the one about efficient and effective administrative and academic processes, which to just quote and just take a little bit of what they were saying, the, the object is to re-engineer administrative operational processes, that should be processes and procedures to make them simpler, more transparent, efficient and effective to achieve optimal stakeholder satisfaction. The stakeholder that I'm interested in or we're going to be discussing this afternoon is a student. So I'm tying that in with the, another strategic theme, the student engagement and experience. High quality to produce a high, or to have the students have a high quality student experience. How many of the room are involved in any of the processes to deal with students. This is from application, admission, grading, input to grade book, board of examiners. We are all involved and part of those processes. So what I'm gonna look at is how can we better use our IT, and I hesitate again, I put a quote around IT, to make these processes, you see the keywords there? Simpler, more transparent, efficient, and effective to achieve optimal stakeholder satisfaction. And by the way, we are stakeholders as well. And a lot of our time is spent on the administrative side, even though we don't necessarily see it because we are so busy interacting with students on a day-to-day -day operational basis. Key stakeholder is the IT department, the IT services. And quite recently, Patrick, that has been approved recently, right? Right, this, the UE IT Services Strategy Plan has been approved. Notice it's not a strategic plan, so it's not there necessarily just for five years, but it acts as the foundation, to, and it, they have moved focus or changed focus from operational excellence, which is what got us to 2012, and infrastructure, to the next strategic cycle, 2012-17, so that we can engage now strategically and leverage that infrastructure. So a lot of what we were talking about and a lot of what is involved in the new strategic plan and the new thrusts and how we interact with students and blended learning and all those policies that have to come on board 
and do we have the capacity to do what we aim to do so that if every one of the lecturers decided to add video as part of the coursework component, can the IT services infrastructure allow that to happen and have those students upload it into e-learning and so on. So all of those have to come into play. And of course, from a faculty standpoint or strategic context, service to our stakeholder community, which just does not involve staff, academic staff, it involves administrative staff, it involves undergraduate students, it involves graduate students, and it involves all the government and non-governmental agencies that we work with. So, that this, and this, so the stakeholder community is much bigger than it might first appear when we compare what we do on a day-to-day -day basis with what the strategic intent is. And by now, everybody knows the last one. One of the thrusts of the new <laughs> revenue generation. So you'll see in the Faculty of Social Sciences, we did respond over the last strategic period with a slew of master's programs in many relevant areas and so on. All of them, I can't think of one that really is not heavily subscribed. In fact, we've got to the stage now where some of our graduate classes look like the undergraduate classes in some of the other faculties. And we have to, as we go ahead, make some key strategic decisions about how do we deliver, how do we cap, knowing on the other hand, the university needs revenue. So some of those considerations are in play as well. Um, if, you, if you let me have for like one minute, this is a teaching moment, so don't go to sleep. You should be able to find yourself, I want you to picture what you do in a semester. And the unique thing about working at a university is that you are not necessarily, all of us are not necessarily at strategic level in our day-to-day -day activities, but you are the CEO of your course. Hmm. So while you are not involved in the governance necessarily structure at the strategic level on campus, you are making these types of decisions for your course. So a student comes to you and says, I had an operation in March. I'm having an operation in March. Now that wasn't scheduled, you didn't know the student was gonna to come to you, but you have a term long action learning project. How are you gonna deal with that? You tell the student, well, write and say that you're gonna deregister from this course or ask to be deregistered from the course, are you gonna accommodate that student? We also do the tactical things. Um, for anybody in a course bigger than 50 students, you now have people working for you you have tutors. <laughs> because if you are teaching 12 hours, we're now up to 12 hours in the Faculty of Social Sciences, if you're teaching 12 hours and you have classes that are really large, you can't teach everything. So suddenly you become an HR manager dealing with the tutors, Glenda, we're talking about who don't correct in the time schedule that you need them to correct so you can upload those marks. And you have to make decisions there. And of course, the operational side of it, when those scripts are finally done, and I know for me that when I shut the book on that last script, and now I go about it slightly differently, I used to have the stack in front of me, now I just take 20 at a time and hide all the rest so that I, I fool my mind that I'm only dealing with 20. But I know when I'm done, now to turn my attention to gradebook is really painful to do that entering of the marks as consistently as I need to. And I have to remind myself that there's a person attached to every script. There's a human being, it's not, it's not just numbers. And therefore, if I don't do it properly, a person is affected. But at six or seven o'clock in the morning when you finish that last script, sometimes it can be difficult to convince yourself that that's really important at that particular point in time. So that's where the operational side of what we do come in. So a teaching moment, different levels in organizations, but we as faculty and those involved in the university setting, we move and toggle between this sometimes daily. Many times a day we're moving from one level to another level to another level, and we have to have the supports, whether they're electronic or paper-based or just in our gut or in our head to deal with the decisions that we have to make on a day-to-day -day basis. If I map this, on top of the different support systems that are actually in place, the IT department has done a wonderful job of getting us here, transaction processing systems. Those are the grade books. Those are the student registration systems. 
Those are the bursary, getting payment from students for the courses that they want to do. What we are now struggling to get through is to get to the middle and the, the, the two middle ones, the management information systems and the decision support systems. So that when do I know that I need another CRN? CRN, another section for the course. So a course has 200 students. There are another 50 students clamoring to get into that course. The decision for the head of department and the examiner for that course is, do you add another 50 to this offering of the course? Or do you delay that and put it on next semester or next academic year? Because if you add another 50 to the course, this means two more tutorials. And then you hit timetabling. Because even though you might be willing and you can find personnel and money to do this, can we physically fit them on campus anywhere? That's not a transaction process. That's not a transaction. That's a management information system. The transaction processing system stores all the data, all the transactions. If you think of it in an organization, it's that you're going to the bank and depositing and taking out money. Deciding whether to give you a loan, though, means that the bank manager has to go to different types of systems. So that the evolution that I was, of which I was speaking, we have now become operationally efficient and excellent. We have great infrastructure. I know some of us struggle with some of it some of the time, but by and large, they've done a wonderful job. Our focus now is to change from just processing data to actually using the information that is available, sometimes in weird manipulations, you actually get what you want. But to make that simpler, more transparent, more efficient, so, and more effective, so that the average non-IS person, so we are moving from the IT, which is the technology now, to the systems that will allow me to get information on which I can act. So our focus strategically has to shift from the operational roles that we play to the decision making and using the information that is now stored so that we can get our job done more efficiently, but even more than efficiency, more effectively. Having been deputy dean for a number of years, I found it frustrating every year to have to solve the same problems. So you come in, it's like, good, got this beat, understood that, put procedures in place, and then you come the next academic year and the same thing is staring me in the face. So there's some meetings that I sit in, when I calculate the number of hours we're sitting in that meeting by the salaries being paid of the people in that meeting, and our ROI, our return on an investment for such a meeting doesn't seem to make sense. So when we have a meeting that lasts for 12 hours, as we did last week, and you calculate what the university just paid, really, can I be doing something else that is more impactful? I'm not saying that the process wasn't important. It's extremely important. But maybe the way that we're going about it can be tweaked somewhat. The tools that I find invaluable in what I do, or what we do, the Banner Student Administration System, that's SAS. That is everything from C Most of us would, the student end would know it as CHOL, KFL Online, where the students register, where you go to see your CRNs and so on. And that is the major operational system which captures all the data. But that is not sufficient for me to act effectively in my deputy deanship. So there is a piece of software developed called BannerMate, which sits on top of Banner and can produce a whole slew of really interesting stuff. So if you give me a moment, I will show you some of that. So I'm preparing for the presentation. And when I went back to the office, I told them, run it again for me so I can give you up-to-date information. If I want to know how many students are registered, in any, in the faculty, this is, a, this is one for the entire faculty. I don't have to go into Banner itself 
or into Kaifen online. Banner Mits Mates sits on top of the banner system and pulls that data for me. And that's what we mean, that that's the difference between an informa a management information system and just the transaction processing system. This is like getting your bank statements at the end of the month without having to go through each individual transaction to figure out what your end of month balance is. So this gives it to me, I'm just gonna go through really quickly. For every program, and if I just wanted a summary, this is a summary of what the faculty enrollment looked like this, for this academic year. We are the largest faculty on campus. We have about 50% of the student population. So the student population is about, what's my math before lunch? Just under 9,000. And this is the undergraduate student population. If you add another, I think about 1,500 on top of that, you're looking at the graduate student population. So in total, we have about 10,000 plus students on campus. This has plateaued over the last three or four years. So the undergraduate student population has pretty much remained stable, somewhere between 4,000 and 4,300. While the graduate student population, even in this recession, has been steadily building. We were surprised because we were planning for a much decreased enrollment. And even though many students are now deciding to come part-time rather than full-time, they're still coming. So I guess they're using this opportunity to retool and go back onto the marketplace when the economy picks up. But they, this can be done at the faculty level, at a departmental level. So here's the Department of Econ. So when you're making decisions about courses to offer, programs that might be integrated and so on, you can pull this up off banner mate. So for the Department of Economics, the head of department can see at a glance where his department is. So there's 624 students, if I look at the summary, registered in that department. The ratio of males to females, no surprise here. This is sort of common now right around campus. 370 males to 254 females. And you're seeing which are the more popular programs, which are the programs that we have challenges with, that we're gonna have to throw more resources at, and so on. Occasionally we get other faculties arguing about the numbers of students coming across from so you pull up this and say, don't deal on gut, deal on facts. Mm. So if you're telling me, uh, sorry, Nicole, if I, you're telling me that the law program has all these soul size students come from it, because we see some of them, I ask them, how many are we talking about? Harbor Business Review has undergone a whole set of research on decision making. And even though gut feel is important, if you have data, use your data. And I find that in this transition period, this is what we need to sort of refocus or focus our attention on. So when you tell me that there are so many students in the law program, I can then point out, okay, in this particular, there are three in economics with law, and there are 20 in economics and law, so that's a total of 23. We have some other, but it's not hundreds. Mm -hmm. And then we can get the talk going. We understand what I'm saying here with Banner Me. And there are others that I could show you, but in the interest of time, I won't go through. The other systems I'm gonna talk about when we go through the process of presentation, anybody who has been in, on campus during registration period and I can see the ones who are holding their head and shaking and, yes, <laughs> are involved heavily in registration and particularly in the Faculty of Social Sciences and particularly within the faculty in the Department of Management. That third system was a necessity, but it's also three weeks of torture. And I don't, I don't say that, I don't over-exaggerate. That's all we're doing, really, in the faculty, it seems like, for three weeks. So beyond that, all the other important stuff, sorry, all of the other important stuff is superseded by the urgent stuff. So a lot of what we need to get done, don't get done unless you do have those of us who seem to not live anywhere, getting that out of the way and still doing what we have to do. This is a screenshot of Bannermate. For those of you who are in governance within your faculties and you've never heard of Bannermate, immediately on completion of this week of workshops, 
get hold of, it's not EMS, it's David. David, what's David's last name? Mark. He comes and installs Bannermate on your system. You do need to log in to the system in order to get access. But like I said, it's one of those saving tools. Everything from how many students have we offered places to so that we can plan for the upcoming academic year. We don't have to wait until students turn up to say, oh, well, we only have two students for this program. We didn't anticipate that. We thought 400 were coming versus we only have... We have 800 students trying to get into a course because there were so many offers for that particular program and we were unaware of it. So Bannermate allows you to plan ahead. Is it perfect? No. Because it will show offers, but it won't necessarily show acceptances. So some students say they accept the offer, some students just turn up. But it gives you a much better idea than a gut feel. Well, I figure only two without any evidence to support what you're doing. How does a student get from start to finish? They apply, this is online now totally. I think it went totally online about three years ago. Before that, you could actually supplement it with paper-based app uh, applications. The application process then leads into the admissions process. The admissions process leads into the registration process, and you could see yourself at different roles and responsibilities here. The registration process leads into a student following a particular degree with particular requirements, all laid out in a faculty handbook, but some of our students don't read the faculty handbooks and can run themselves into trouble by doing courses that won't count towards the completion of their program. So that the progression is supplemented by advisors and I know this is a contentious issue across all the campuses, but really, every student enrolled in every program must, I, I'm going beyond should, must have an academic advisor. Who that person is is up to the faculties. But a student must have somebody in the academic part of the campus who understands the program and can guide them through it. And of course, graduation. This should take maximum of six years. We allow six years plus one. It should not take any longer than that. That's the maximum. Many of our students do graduate in four years or under. Some of them take longer because they're doing the program part-time. Some of them are doing the program part-time and, part and have hiccups. So that's why the seven years. I'm going to go through the processes pretty quickly. The online application leads to the processing of the applicants. Basically, what that involves is assigning a number of points to students. So students get points for CSEC, they get points for CAPE, they get points for their associate degrees and so on. Students above a particular threshold, they automatically get admitted to their first choice. So three or four years ago, we said we don't... We used to have a meeting called the Entrance Committee Meeting, which was another all-day meeting. So we said, anybody scoring above two points, we don't want to see. Those are full matric, those are students usually with the associate degree or CAPE at the level that we want. They have math, they have English. We don't want to see them. Admit them. So the only people that we want to see are people below, two or below, because then we have to make some decisions about them. We even told them, if they don't have math, they can't get into the faculty because the faculty requires math. So don't send them and then we have to process them to reject them. Give them their, they can't get into the faculty and they can't get into the faculty, particularly in programs in the Department of Economics and the Department of Management Studies because they all require math. You're putting the students at a disadvantage if you take them into a program that requires math and they've not done CXC or CSEC math. So we don't want to see them. What I'm trying to get to in order to be efficient is to not have the special cases because the special cases take up time, lots of it, where you have to do process each individual piece of paper or each individual student. So if we can en masse do something, en masse do it. Um, offers, 
then translate into entry. And this is where it gets a bit dicey because even though we've made offers, that does not necessarily translate to those numbers of students coming in to the program. And this is where now you have to do that plus or minus 10% different depending on the faculty and depending on your history. What are we going to plan for? Now one of the contentions of the faculty of social sciences is the number of spaces allocated for the foundation courses. And we have said it ad nauseum. If you bring in 4,000, if you bring in 1,000 students, half of those are going to be full time. For the faculty alone, you must have 500 spaces in the English courses. This is not a hard math problem. If you only make 300 spaces available, then you have a deficit of 200 students trying to struggle to get into those programs in the next academic year. And then you have the phone calls back and forth. So I know some of it is a student's fault. They don't treat them as important. So they wait until the summer before their potential graduate to register for the English courses. So I'm not talking about those students. But by far and large, we see students come in struggling every year to get into the programs because not enough spaces are allocated. And I understand the challenge with FHE, and it's all about resources. But if I kick this up above my pay level, if we're gonna bring them in, we have to give them access. Registration. This is what registration looks like from a student's point of view or from those who are not deeply involved from the faculty view of registration. We have on-campus registration with new and continuing students. Those new and continuing students actually are not as straightforward as it might seem at first glance because we have students coming onto campus from other tertiary level institutes with which we have relationships. So Antigua State College, those students do two years in Antigua and then come to Barbados for their final year. And this is replicated throughout the Caribbean depending on where they're located, which campus they go to for their final year. Every year we were experiencing problems with these students at registration because our system did not talk to the system that actually has their grades in. So when these students hit Cave Hill as a third year student, guess what our system told them? They're a first year student, so they don't have 60 credits with prerequisites in so that when they should be able to register for a final year course, they can't because the credits haven't come with the student. What that translates into is the student submitting an override. Can't get into MIS 2 because it's not showing that I have MIS 1 when they have legal access to MIS 2. So you know what the students do? They fill in an override. So if we have 40 students coming from Antigua State College times five courses each, that's 200 individual cases that we have to look at to get them registered. Right now, the faculty processes about 3,000 overrides a semester. This is why we're not doing anything else for three weeks during registration. We do have, and I hope I have all of your support in your faculty boards, please. We are about to ask for, I've already done it at academic board, we're about to ask for a shortened registration period. There's no reason why electronically we need a four week registration period. So we have the two weeks pre-registration and we have one week when teaching starts of registration. And then we shut registration off to students so that the overrides and so on, can be processed and get those students in classes by week two. Because by the time we process overrides now, some students are not legitimately in classes until week four and five. Now in a 12 week semester, and my hands are sort of tied because technically I am not supposed to tell the student to go to a class unless you are registered. Because you are not registered and therefore you're not paid up. And therefore, you do not have access to classes, you do not have access to e-learning, you do not have access to the resources of that course. That's one hand. That's the administrative deputy dean hand. I'm an examiner, I'm a lecturer. So I know that that's gonna be sorted out something. I need that student in the course because of all the online material and action learning and quizzes and stuff that's going on. You cannot be afford to be out of my course for five weeks. 
By the time you get into my course, you could as well not do it. So that's my examiner hat, and they fight all the time. Can't tell the student to go to class, can't not tell the student to go to class. This is made worse for a level three potential graduate student. This student is supposed to be out of university by June. Scholarship is up by June. Can't get into a course in January. What do you tell the student? I'm on tape, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's the struggle that we have within the offices. Advanced standing students also present challenges. Those are students who come in and only do two years. So they've done two years at a community college recognized program, and then they do their final two years here. If those exemptions and credits don't come before they attempt to register, we also have those to deal with. So for the faculty view of what registration looks like, we're dealing with exemptions and overrides. How do we want to solve this? We want, override, we want exemptions to be automatic. So if student has, we have something called the university, UWI, it's not KFIL, UWI compendium, which is all the agreements across all the campuses of all the exemptions that the students can get. I don't want to know what's in that book. You know why I don't want to know what's in that book? Because it can be quoted. So I don't want a student come and asking me if they've done Caribbean studies, can they get exemption from Caribbean civilization? I don't want to know the answer to that. I want when they present their qualifications at the university and it's certified, those exemptions go in. So when I pull up a student's CAP compliance, I say, oh, no, you don't have to do Caribbean SIF because you're exempted from it without ever having to know the paddling that went underneath to get that done. The override process, we are trying to ensure that all of our programs are correctly coded within Banner so that, and I'm crossing every digit that I have now, so that by September registration, no student will be blocked from registration, from registering for a course if they should be able to register from the course, except if the course is full. And then we are waitlisting that. So that the ones that supply, apply for override, I can say no. I can close my eyes and say no. Because only a couple of things could have happened. You don't have the prerequisite or the course is full. Or it's not part of your program and it's a restricted course. So then that three weeks of torture can devolve into a couple of days of saying no. I'm feeling confident that I can say no because we've not disadvantaged a student. Progression, course and tutorial registration, that's up to the student. Students have difficulty changing CRN. So you have the occasional student who, because of job commitments, can't make that Thursday two to three tutorial and want to change it to a Friday five to six tutorial, but they dare not. And this is, again, the two competing sides of what I do. In order to register, change that, they have to drop the course and add it again, both parts, both the lecture and the tutorial. The problem with that is that for some of our courses, the more popular ones, and the heavily populated courses, if they dare drop, we have students at the moment, if registration starts at 10 o'clock Monday morning, are sitting at their terminals from 9.30, waiting to register, so that by the next day, that course is full. I'm not, not talking 10 slots, I'm talking 200, 300 slots. Course is gone. So that if you drop a course like that, in the seconds that it takes you to click another CRN, spot is gone. Once you delete your, once you delete that, you once you web drop that course, you're not getting back into that course. So that becomes an override and that becomes a special case for us to deal with. We haven't worked out technologically how because we want tutorials tied to courses, to see to lectures. Um, grade book. The cry of the Faculty of Social Sciences, particularly the Department of Management Studies, where we have lots of group work. If I have a course of 200 and I divide into groups of five, that's 40 sets of marks I have to enter and monitor. In Excel, this is easy. We do it in a group. We spread those marks across the, the, the 200. It's done. The Excel upload, which we knew about because it worked several years ago. When you build your coursework assignments in Excel, couple of clicks and it feeds into gradebook. This is why we are fighting so desperately hard, desperately, desperately, desperately hard to get this back. 
every iteration of Banner and Gradebook wipes out the add-ins apparently, and they don't rebuild it. Colin and me have called your name on so many occasions, like, we would hire Colin to write the JavaScript. That's because that's what it entails, really. So that we can monitor and more efficiently and effectively enter the grades in a non-rush fashion. And then you can make those decisions. A student presents at 39. Are you leaving them at 39? You may want to, but to make that decision, you now have to go pull back up what has that student done. But in the time frame that we have from marking scripts, entering grades, getting it uploaded, examiner's meetings, there's no time to make those kinds of decisions. And anybody who's seen a grade but screen is in numbers. Where sometimes two or three digits are transposed from students. So with the best will and intention, and I know I also sit on the campus committee for examination, so I know the reports come. If we're entering about a thousand marks, and 50 of those have gone haywire, I say that's a pretty good return. Of course, those 50 marks are attached to 50 human beings, which are going to go to exams and so on. But because of the way gradebook is presented, I see double. And it can take days sometimes to make sure that that script number is the same number you entered in gradebook. It's the same student ID number that that's supposed to go on. So I'm not saying not to do our jobs well, but I'm saying some of the technology tools can enable us to do this more effectively and efficiently. Mm -hmm. Progression from the faculty view, board of examiners meetings. We deal with medicals, we deal with special cases. We got rid of medicals because we hired a chief medical officer. One of the challenges is if a student says they had a headache and the doctor said the student had a headache, and therefore could not take the exam, what are you going to do? They say the doctor doesn't know what they're talking about. With our chief medical officer, we don't see any of those anymore. Let the medics deal with the medics. So our examiner's medicals meeting that used to last a day now lasts 10 minutes. Unfortunately, our special cases now takes up three hours. That was about an hour. That's now three hours. Because that door has shut. So students with life experiences that may have impacted on their academic performance. They write a letter to the dean. The dean takes it to the Board of Examiners meetings. Students on warning and RTW used to be a nightmare to figure this out. And then I sat down one day and was like, this doesn't make sense. All of this is digital. So I spoke to David. And now this has become a standard part of the meeting. We get an RTW list. Much bigger. Too big. The names and so on have been removed, but this would be each student whose academic standing at the end of the last semester was required to withdraw. Because of the challenge with foundation courses not counting for credits, occasionally you will have students who are registered for foundation courses and therefore, even though they pass all three or they pass three of five, would end up on warning, there's, a, there's an equivalent warning list, would end up on warning illegitimately. So I asked to show the course, the, the, to see the foundation courses. We now have to tweak this because I, just, I don't want to see just the students who registered for foundation courses. I want to see students who passed foundation courses. Because if you registered and then pass it, then you're still RTW. But if you passed it, it could have an impact. And I am not going through, there are like 166 cases here. I am not opening 166 records to identify this. What we do here now, notice that each program is identified. We give this to all of the examiners, the, the course coordinators. You deal with the students. Students on warning should have academic counseling. RTWs are RTWs. Required to withdraw does not mean you come and negotiate. Warning means you come and negotiate. Let's see what you need to do better. RTW means you are no longer a student of the University of the West Indies. Just a couple more slides and we'll wrap up. And now, of course, we process the examination results. We have not been doing rate of progress 
unless it's an extreme case, we focus much more on GPA, which is warning and RTW. Rate of progress says that if you've taken 14 years to get to this point, uh, no. No. The reason that that becomes important and the new GPA standards to sort of, sort of fix this, which comes into effect next academic year, where the GPA for minimum GPA is two, and the pass mark is moving to 50 rather than 40%, that comes into effect next academic year, not this academic year. Sorry, academic year 2014, not academic year 2013. Because you can have completed the credits for the university, but your GPA is too low to graduate. So we are trying to weed, identify these people as early as possible and weed them out. And it's not usually a case of having rescinded the RTW, bringing those students back. Sometimes what happens is a student is on academic warning, then they barely scrape by the next year, next term, so they go back to good standing, and then they go back on academic warning, and then good standing, academic warning. So those students would never have had the opportunity to be kicked out of the system. And you, end up with, you can end up with a student with a GPA less than or graduating GPA. There is no degree from the university with a GPA less than one. The future, we have the strategy plan for IT um, approved. And in part of that plan is now coming to the campuses for individual campus implementation. And many of the faculties are already doing this under the new structure. Well, the vice chancellor is see everything, and the principal is responsible for the campus management of IT services. A lot of the work has now been devolved to the individual faculties where we need the support. So every faculty has a faculty advisory committee where the IT, and I'm, if you put an X through IT, where the IS, the information systems needs of the faculty can really get to the ear of where it needs to get to in a timely fashion. So like the Excel upload, we might be actually able to get traction on that. The last thing I want to state is for the advisors, I am, I've, we've asked for this to be implemented in a manner we don't know how possible. When you counsel the student, we need to have a place to put what you told the student into the student's record. So if they go, if you told, for example, a student is on academic warning, I advise them not to register for more than nine credits. Our courses are three credits each, not to register for more than nine credits. They go to somebody else. When they pull up the record, they should be able to see on the student's record that they were counseled and told not to register for more than nine credits, but yet they registered for 18 and want you to now rescind an RTW. So we need to find a way to capture that in one place. We do it in different places right now and it's not useful in making decisions going on. So that's it from the administrator who's still a faculty member's hat and I hope that it gave you some insight into the role that I S and IT can plays as we rock the boat going forward. Thank you.